So today we're taking a trip back into 1876 and to the sad tale of young Emily Holland. Aged just seven when her life was cruelly taken away from her. And it was here on Burley Street and Moss Street, which is further down, where these events unfortunately took place. It's a tragic story and uh, it's quite a disturbing one at that. So if you're easily offended with anything that may be gory, and obviously it involves a little child as well, you may not want to uh, to listen to some of the the gory parts but uh yeah it's just a bit of a bit of a warning if you will because like i said it's uh it's probably one of the most disturbing stories that i've covered since doing the days of horror podcast and it's the very first story that i covered i think it was back in july last year so this is like uh what's the word i'm looking for it's like we're coming back we've gone full circle if you will we did the podcast and now we're going to do the actual video locations of where all these places took place at you know all these things took place at, i should say but yeah this is burley street we've got st albans court in front of us but behind me is where young emily used to go to school at st albans roman catholic school obviously it's the church now um but yeah this is where it all began back here on the 20th of march 1876 Now we're walking down what is known as Burley Street uh, and this is the the place where Emily lived with her family and it was on the 20th of March 1876 when she was out playing with her friends she just finished school um, which was St Albans Roman Catholic Church which is at the side of me and uh, basically it was mid-afternoon and she'd gone out and she'd gone to her friends and she said, oh, before I can play with you, I've got to do an errand. And she said, she's got to do this errand for this guy. And she pointed over to the corner of a street where this shady lucky character was standing. So anyway, so he'd give him some money. He'd give him some money. He'd give her some money. And uh, off she popped to the local tobacconist, George Cox's tobacconist shop on Trinity. I think it's Trinity Street, Trinity Terrace. Um, yeah, definitely Trinity Street. So anyway, she's gone into the shop and she's bought the tobacco. Now, on the way out, one of the young guys who was in the shop passed who the tobacco was for, and she said, it's for that guy over there. And she pointed to this chap on the corner. Unfortunately, that was the last time she was ever seen alive again. So right in front of us, I'm not sure if it's to the right or to the left, but definitely one of these two spaces is where William Fish used to have his barber shop. And it was there that Emily... Young Emily had left the tobacco in the shop here on Trinity Street. You can see the sign. And somewhere along here, there was a row of houses. And on one of these, you had George Cox's tobacco in the shop. So she's left the shop. She's pointed over to this direction. Like I said, it's either to the left or to the right. It's very difficult to tell. And that is known as Moss Street. So it used to be known as Moss Street. And as you can tell now, it's been all redeveloped. You've got new houses. But Moss Street basically went all the way up. And there's a car just in the distance that joins back onto Moss Street. But here is where William Fish had his tobacco shop, and it's here where young Emily had crossed the road. She's gone into uh, William's shop, um, and she's passed all the tobacco, and then he said to her, can you go upstairs? And she did do. Now, it was at that point he's followed her upstairs, and that is when, obviously, the, the actual scene, the horrific scene, unfolded. Um, Basically, I mean, what he did to her was horrific that day. Um, whilst she was upstairs in the room, he's raped her. After he was satisfied that she was dead, he's then slit her throat and then cut her head off. He's cut her arms and legs off. And then he's made the decision to try and dispose of the body. Now, what he's done, he's put Emily's head into the chimney breast along with some other remains of hers and tried to set a fire to it. 
and then over the course of the next 24 hours he's made his way up to a place called Basswell where we're going to go to shortly and that is where he's dumped the torso of Emily. The legs ended up in a culvert over in Rishton um, and it was quite an horrific scene. Now we'll go into more about William shortly and um, we'll talk about his life when he was younger and you know I mean he was 23 years old and he created such a a scene of de a destruction if you will but yeah it's not the uh, it's not the nicest of stories Now one of the interesting uh, aspects of this whole story is how William was captured and the police at the time, they'd obviously they found the torso uh, and when it went sent back to the town hall in Blackburn, during the post-mortem they found fibres of hair, different shades of hair that was um, wrapped in the newspaper or was caught in the newspaper with the torso. But the hair was different colours and anyway originally the police thought that the murderer may well have been a tramp because there were a lot of tramps seen in this neighbourhood at the time on Burley Street um, but one of the police constables at the time straight away thought a tramp wouldn't carry newspapers that were well they would carry newspapers but they wouldn't carry them in consi what's the word what's, is it consequential not consequential but the numbers basically of the papers were in order and which tramp literally buys newspapers every day and keeps them. So straight away with all the hair fibres they actually came to the conclusion it may well have been a local barber. Now William Fish on Burley Street, just well just off, off onto Moss Street, he was interviewed at the time but they went to his house and obviously they interviewed him he said he didn't know anything about it so uh, they let him go they didn't, they didn't have anything else to, um, to question him on. So anyway um, it was later on Obviously the police were getting nowhere, there was a massive manhunt, there was a massive search for Emily's, the rest of Emily's remains. They searched fields, culverts, cesspools, they searched everywhere for the rest of Emily's body without, without any success. But anyway, um, as time went on, the use of bloodhounds were used for the very first time to try and solve a case. Now the bloodhound Morgan was brought in from somewhere in Preston and they took him to William, or they took the dog to William Fish's premises, the barber shop, and that is where the bloodhounds, it searched downstairs and it didn't find anything. There were two of them, two bloodhounds, but it was Morgan that went upstairs into the upper floor where obviously Emily was murdered, and it started barking at the chimney breast. Now, obviously this alerted the police, the police went upstairs, they put their hand and they had a quick look underneath the chimney and that is obviously where the skull of Emily was found. Obviously it was badly burnt and it wasn't a pretty sight. So obviously William is then instantly arrested and that is when he came out with um, things basically saying he, do, he didn't know what possessed him to do it. He, was, he wasn't under any control, he didn't mean to kill her. But yeah, um, it's a sad, sad story. But again, it was a first for Blackburn. It was a first for police investigations. The use of a bloodhound to help solve a crime. It was a bloodhound Morgan, and I'll put a picture up so you guys can see exactly what the dog looked like. But this in front of me, this is St Albans Roman Catholic Church. This is the school where young Emily attended back in 1876. Like I said, guys, all this is Burley Street. That's in front of me. On Burley Street now, um, there's been a lot of redevelopments. Now there is an interesting location I'm going to go to next, and I think it's what is used to be known as an old cinder path, a cinder lane, and it's the same route which William took 
uh, back in 1876 when it went to dispose of the remains of, of Emily. So we're going to go there now and I'll show you guys exactly where Basswell is and where the cinder path is and used to be. But obviously it's changed a lot since then. But we'll go there now. So, believe it or not, this is what I believe to be the old cinder path. Now, this is the path which William Fish carried the torso of young Emily after he did, or after he committed his foul deed. We've got St Michael's Court in front, which leads directly down to Burley Street, and then obviously onto Moss Street, where the murder took place. But this pathway here, if you look at the old maps, used to be an old lane. And it was here where William, obviously, which I believe, this is where he came with the body of uh, of Emily. And directly in front, just going up the hill line there where the, tr where the houses are and the trees, that is heading towards where Basswell is. Now we're going to head up to there shortly. I'm not sure if we'll be able to actually get to the, the place where Emily's body was um, discovered because everything's changed. I mean, I mean, everything. So yeah, we won't be able to see much anyway. But yeah, this is the old, this is the old cinder path anyway, where William came on that uh, that horrific evening back in 1876. I mean, these metal um, whatever they are structures here, he may well have touched them. He may have put his hand on them when he came by. These here. I'm not sure if you could quite see it through the trees, but there's a mosque just in the distance there. But over in that area, and there's another one to the right of it, but in that area that is known as Basswell. Now that is where um, Emily's body was discovered. And it was, uh, I know it sounds a bit callous, but her torso was literally dumped over a six foot high wall. And it was discovered by um, some young kids that was playing in fields at the time. Um, they went for help and one of the neighbours from Basswell Terrace came up and she discovered the parcel for herself and that is obviously when all the uh, the events unfolded quite dramatically after that, after that. But yeah, just through these tree lines you've got the mosque, the mosque there and it's directly in front of there, that is where we're headed to next. Now we're at the top of Basswell, what is known as Basswell Terrace, and it's here, exactly here, where the body of Emily was found, the torso of Emily was found. I'm not sure if you can see it, but just through the trees here, I still think it's an old farm. I think it's an old farmhouse, but obviously it's more domestic now, if you will. 
but it was here, round about here, in this location, where obviously William has come up through the cinder path, he's walked up from this direction which we've just been down. You can see the courts, the, the flat city, the distance where Burley Street is, where Moss Street is, so it's not that far to walk. And basically he's walked up with a torso, he's made his way up over the cinder path, up through the fields which would have been here at the time, he's come across here and the body I think personally was dumped somewhere in this location. You've got the farmhouse and all the newspaper reports at the time seem to indicate it was buried over a six foot wall near a farmhouse. And also Basswood Terrace, um, all the witnesses came down and this is where they found obviously the body. There's a field which is we've got here. Um, you know it must have been a, a, an horrific sight. But yeah, um, this is uh, this is Basswell. This is where we are now, and this is where, obviously, William. Well, this is where he tried to dispose and get rid of all the evidence. It's, it's a bit. Um, it is. It's one of the worst stories I think I've covered so far on the Days of Horror podcast. You know, but this is what we do. We um, we uncover the past. We talk about the the hard, harsher times, if you feel, and the sick things that went on back in Victorian England. And we don't want to forget, we don't want to forget young Emily, Alice Beetham, you know, Thomas Dennison, all these people we don't want to forget. But yeah, as you can see, the field's still here, you've got all the shrubbery, and you've got the farmhouse, or the, it was the farmhouse back in the day, hidden behind the trees there. So the funeral of Emily took place here in Blackburn Cemetery on the 7th of April 1876. Um, it, the streets were lined, the streets were lined with people all willing to pay their respects because obviously at the end of the day we're talking about a young girl, a seven year old girl that was brutally murdered and callously as well, you know it wasn't just an accident, her life was cruelly taken away from her. But we're here now in the Blackburn Old Cemetery and her grave, I have to say, and I'll show you guys now, but her grave has been remarkably looked after by the friends of Blackburn Old Cemetery. You can just make out Emily's name. Emily, I think it's H or is it M Emily M Holland, I think she's called Mary, middle name. And obviously it's all faded but you can just make out the date of her funeral. And you've also got her father and her mother, James and Elizabeth, also buried. So James Holland died January 28th, 1918, aged 74 years. His wife, Elizabeth, she died in March the 30th, 1925, aged 79 years. So it's kind of nice that, obviously, they're all buried together. But yeah, this is the, uh, the final resting spot of young Emily Holland. So it was two days later on the 30th of March when the body of Emily was discovered uh, and it was discovered over in Basswell where we've just been. Um, now obviously things escalated from then on and like we've touched upon you know William he was arrested um, after the bloodhounds had been into his barber shop you know they sniffed out I know it sounds a bit a bit crude but they sniffed out the remains of Emily who well she was basically stuffed wasn't she inside a, a chimney and I know that sounds really callous and the wording may not be right but that's what happened uh, so obviously things things quickly developed from there you know William was taken into custody he was questioned 
Uh, yeah, and obviously he was sent to the Liverpool Assizes where he would be tried and found guilty for the murder of Emily. Now, he was hung inside with the walls of Kirkdale Prison. Um, obviously he left his family behind him and up until his last breath, he still pleaded that he, you know, he maintained that he never meant to kill Emily and he doesn't know what possessed him that day. Now, I'm going to read a little snippet off my form, which I've got, because it's quite a long confession from William Fish. Um, but basically, on Monday, April 17th, I'm not sure if you can hear me with the wind, but on Monday, April 17th, uh, Fish was brought before the magistrates and he was formally charged with the murder of Emily. Now, whilst he was arrested and he was in the town hall, the police station at the town hall in Blackburn, he, um, he made a confession. Now, this is what William Fish said. I told Constable William Parkinson that I burned parts of the claws and put the other parts under the coal in my shop, and now I wish to say I am guilty of the murder. I further wish to say that I do not want the innocent to suffer. At a few minutes after five o'clock in the evening, I was standing at my shop door in Moss Street when the deceased child came past. She was going up to Moss Street and I asked her to bring me one half ounce of tobacco from Cox's shop. She went and brought it to me. I asked her to go into my shop, she did. I asked her to go upstairs and she did. I went up with her, I tried to abuse her and she was nearly dead. I then cut her throat with a razor. This was in the front room near the fire. I then carried the body downstairs into the shop, cut off head, arms and legs, wrapped up the body in newspapers on the floor, wrapped up the legs in newspapers and put these parcels into a box in the kitchen. The arms and head I put into the fire. On the Wednesday afternoon, I took the parcel containing the legs to Lower Cunliffe, that's where we've just been, uh, sorry, that was over in Richton, I should say, and at nine o'clock that night, I took the parcel containing the body to a field in Baswell, where we've just been, and threw it over the wall. On Friday afternoon, I burnt parts of the clothing. On the Wednesday morning, I took part of the head, which was unburnt, and put it up the chimney in front of the bedroom. I further wish to say that I did all this myself. No other person had anything to do with it, the foregoing statement has been read out to me and is correct. It is my voluntary statement and before I made it, I was told that it would be taken down in writing and given against me as evidence. Signed, William Fish. So there you go. From William Fish's own hands, the full details of what transpired that night, or that evening I should say, when young Emily you know, she went out to do this guy a favour. And apparently she was also known for being friendly and helping people. You know, she never turned a blind eye to those who, who needed help. And she was seven years old. But yet, you know, she was still willing to help people in need. And this, unfortunately, led to her demise. It's a sad tale, it really is. And like I keep saying, it's probably one of the worst stories I've covered. Um, but, you know, it, th these things happened back in the 1800s. And they still go on today, nothing's changed, you know, we hear stories, don't we? You know, I'm not going to name them off now because obviously the more modern ones are still a bit too raw. But uh, these stories, they still go on today and it's, it's, it's a sick world we live in when people can commit such crimes, such atrocities, and especially on young children. I mean, I, I just don't get it, but um, these stories, you know, we, we're going to keep delving into our history. We're going to come to Blackburn, we're going to go to Burnley, we're going to go to Bury, we're going to travel all over. And we're even thinking of travelling up to places like Carlisle for another story this coming weekend. So we are going to be out and about a lot more, doing a lot more travelling. So if you like these stories, please, give us a like, you know, give us a thumbs up, comment down below, subscribe to the channel. Um, hopefully the videos will get better, the quality of the presentation. But in the meantime, guys, you know, like I said, I hope you like it. But take care and look after yourselves. Now, whilst we're here, I'm also going to show you guys the final location of another young girl whose life was tragically taken away from her. And that is the grave, the final resting place of Alice Beetham. Now, this is a story that I've just finished writing for the Days of Horror podcast. Um, but I never actually did a video on that one. That will be coming shortly. We'll do a video on that on another day. But I'll take you over to the final resting place, if I can remember it, of where Alice and her family are buried. And it's not actually too far from Emily. As you can see, Emily's grave is just behind me in this direction. 
and young Alice's is down here. And this is the final resting place of Alice Beetham. Now, as you can tell, there's nowhere, there's actually no grave markers here, which is a shame. But apparently, from what um, I was told by Morris Phelan, um, he is one of the, the the people, one of the guys that maintains the grounds, and as you can tell from when I was last here, well, obviously, guys, you can't tell, but all this has been cut down since. Uh, but what they do, they maintain the grounds here at Blackburn North Cemetery, and they do a fantastic job. Um, but he was telling me a story that when Alice was buried here, the family didn't want a big grave marker. They didn't want all the stones because, as you could say, a bit like now, there were a lot of people, a lot of ghouls, if you will, who wanted to come over here and see for themselves where she was buried. Possibly not to pay respects. I'm not saying they all, they were all ghouls, don't get me wrong, but basically they didn't want a show of it. You know, they wanted her to rest in peace not be forgot about, but just just to be you know just be remembered in the right way, and not of um, these ghoul hunters, if you will. Uh, but obviously today, you know, we're going back to these stories, not as ghouls, but to pay our own respects. And you know, we we want um, we want these people, we want their stories to be told and never forgotten. And it's a bit of a shame that obviously this area, you can see the little holes, the little markings where the graves were. But it's a shame there is no actual memorial stone or there's no markers to it indicate where young Alice is and obviously a family. But yeah, that is where Alice Beetham laid to rest, so to speak. But um, if you guys ever get the chance, make your way here to uh, Blackburn Old Cemetery because there's, there's literally hundreds of people interred here We've all got stories to tell. You've got Fergus Souter, is he called? Now there's a documentary on Netflix channel not so long ago talking about the first professional footballer and how Darwin FC and Blackburn Rovers not just were formed, but you know how they started off in the football league and Fergus Souter was one of the main antagonists of that show and he's buried here in Blackburn. You've got the Friendly Giants, I think he's nicknamed, one of the world's tallest men at the time. He's buried here. So yeah, get yourself down to Blackburn North Cemetery and obviously, you know, dig up some stories for yourselves because honestly, there's, there's literally hundreds here. And obviously, if you can help out the guys here at Blackburn North Cemetery, volunteer maybe, come down some weekends or during the day if, if you're not, not at work, you know. For whatever reason, you can come down and you can help these, these guys do a tremendous job maintaining the graveyard. And they do, they do a fantastic job. I'll leave links down below anyway, so. You could follow them, but yeah. Let's go back down to uh, to where young Emily is. We'll pay our respects one last time. <laughs>